Hi everyone, we are finally back on season 3 and things by the looks of it are about to get complicated. Three big things happened last season that we know are going to throw some curveballs into the Letter Kenny universe. Number one, Katie's departure to pursue her modeling career. Number two, the introduction of Rosie and Wayne's clear attraction to her. And number three, Angie's return to profess her still existing feelings for Wayne and Tannis's quick call to Wayne to tell him that she is pregnant. Now, let's just see how season three shapes out. All right, after autumn. Ask anyone around the area about accuracy. Arctic activities are abundant, astonishing, astounding, and A1 on all accounts. Back up. But before beach bodies, bros better bundle up in boots, blankets, and balaclavas because a bloody bitter breeze will blow brisk, blustery, and bleak. Careful. Correct and common to cocoon in a cap coat and comforter because a cutting cold can consume your character, occasionally create a corpse, and continually compress your cock. Don't. Don't you dare dawdle dilly dally. Much like season two's first episode, season three opens with a use of advertised alliteration as well, but this one's winter themed. Personally, I like this one way more than season two's. But moving on to the episode itself, we see Wayne, Derry, and Dan visiting Tannis and her posse at a bar, when all of a sudden, a fight breaks loose. It still impresses me how straightforward this show is, especially when it comes to character conversations. One thing I didn't expect to happen was how fast Tannis' pregnancy was going to be resolved. I'm okay if that's what you're asking. That's what I'm asking. I wasn't ready to have a kid. Well, that is your choice to make. Goddamn right it's my choice. Sure it is. I'm glad I took care of it. Well, that is your right. Goddamn right it's my right. I'm not even sure if it was yours, but thank you. Thanks for the smokes and pepperettes. I'll see you when I see you, boo. Over and out. Normally in shows, they tiptoe around abortion or make it this long, drawn-out think piece on the morality behind the action. But you don't have to expect that in Letterkenny. Do you know how long it took for them to hash this out? 18 seconds. That's all the time they needed, and I didn't even question a single decision. And that's what I like about this show, and specifically about Wayne's sense of understanding and respecting Tennis' unilateral decision. Bruh. Vo, Jared Kiso, and Jacob Tierney. We're only five minutes into the episode and I'm already praising the writing. Oh my god, this is gonna be a long one. We move on to see Wayne, Squirrely Dan, and Derry hanging out in a shack talking about their craving for sashimis and tunas and salmons before Dan asks when Katie is coming back from the city. And then Wayne says, Oh, she'll come back when she's good and ready. She's figured out. But they're at least expecting her back for sledding season. So to continue what I was saying during my last video about Katie's departure from Letterkenny, this tacked onto my worry a little bit because they didn't give a sure answer on Katie's return. When Squirrelian asked Wayne when she was coming back, we learned that not even he knows, possibly indicating that they haven't even been communicating since she left. Or at the very least, they never discussed when she would be returning. But back to the episode, Dan realizes that there aren't any other shacks like this along the sled trail. And with that, they come up with another building project, much like the one that they did in season one for the produce stand. This time around, they're looking to build another shack. Pre-game Sandos. Check, buddy. Pre-game Nappies. Check, bro. Don Cherry's Rock'em Sock'em Six for motivation. Don Cherry's Rock'em Sock'em Sick. We're now with Riley and Josie to see them mentally checking off items from their pre-game to-do list. I'm personally looking forward to seeing how they improved while we were away during the season break. So I'll go ahead and tell you what I'm looking to really get from this season that we didn't get last season. I am looking for mental growth from them. For the past two seasons, they haven't changed. I thought the gateway to their growth would have been when Katie dumped them, but that didn't go much of anywhere. Come on, Jared and Jacob, give a writer some hope. Jumping back into the episode, we see Riley and Josie getting mobbed by people who appear to be fans. But after they're able to walk by, the camera pans over to the current rankings. The first thing we see are the players rankings, where Riley and Jonesy are both tied for first. However, when it comes to the team rankings, the Letterkenny Irish are in last place. So already, Jared Kiso and Jacob Tierney have heard and answered my prayers. <laughs> they have come back and improved sports-wise. This does beg the question of how the Senior Five treats them now, because all last season they were known as the Schmelz and not taken seriously, but now since they are technically the best in the Senior League, how's the mooch of going to change towards them? So we're going to have the structure. What we're going to do is going to put the space heater here, 
mini fridge here. I'm gonna throw the Jenny right out there. Wayne, Deary, and Dan are planning out how they want to build the shack and even planning how they want the interior to look. And that's for the more important matter. Hey! Hey! Hey. How are you now? Good, and you? Not so bad. You fucking serious with that turtleneck? Lose a lot of heat in the neck. You fucking serious with that hair? You figured it. You figure it out. Katie is back and she is rocking a new blonde look. She also didn't come alone. Behind her enters two guys that she met in the city whose names are Shep and Kingsley. Those are dudes' names? Yeah. And you want to know something? I actually kind of like these guys. Your fucking shirt, Shep. Where's the fuck is your shirt, Kingsley? It's ripped. You ripped? Mine too. How? Because I'm so fat. <sighs> Me too. I'm so fat. I'm a bad faster. I'm a fat podger. Guys. Enough, let's go. If I was a Dr. Seuss book, I'd be the fat in the hat. If I was an arcade fighting game, I'd be Mortal Kombat. If I was one of the five boroughs in New York City, I'd be fat and highly. If I was an Italian city state, I'd be the fatican. Put a fucking shirt on. The hockey team is getting grilled out by the coach for losing again, but the silver lining for our two boys, Riley and Jonesy, is that they actually get some praise by the coach. He even advises the team to take a page out of their book. The coach is asking Riley and Josie in particular to bring home one win and calls upon them to play some selfish hockey. Here's what they mean by that. Skate the puck, don't pass it. Headman's still gonna be there when you catch up with. Take it coast to coast. Shots from poor angles are still shots. Fuck and a half, two minute shifts, three minutes even. Cruise the blue line to catch your breath. Bad balance, that's a good breakaway. Gotta get the bounces, boys. Perfect. Over at the skate residence, we learn of Devin's departure. Real life circumstances aside, it's left a mystery why Devin left, or even where he went. To Rawls' knowledge, since he was the one that hung out with Devin the most, he just disappeared with his stuff. Well, most of his stuff. He ended up leaving behind a guitar and a TV that he stole from his grandmother back in third grade. But as one character leaves the Letterkenny universe, another one enters. And this one we're going to be meeting face to face very soon. Fuck, she looks friendly as a couch, ain't she, boys? Went up faster than shit through a goose, too. In a quick scene, we see that Wayne and the gang finish building the shack faster than expected after receiving some assistance from Tyson and Joint Boy. We move back to Riley and Jonesy as they reflect on their last game and are at least happy with their stats. However, it still wasn't enough for them to win. Unlike the lack of caring they showed in Season 2, they're actually trying to take initiative. Our boys are growing up. All that's left to do now is to figure out what's going on with the other players because as we've seen, or at least heard, Riley and Jonesy are firing on all cylinders. We find out why everyone is off their game and it's because all of their wives left them. But why? Why would all of their wives leave if they love them so much? What could have led them off that path of commitment? Well... Angie? Boys. But it looks like the hockey world has a term for instances like this where a girl affects the proficiency of the team. I think we've got a puck bunny. <laughs> Derry, Dan, and Wayne, accompanied by a mystery character with their helmet still on, pay a visit to the shack who once is dark. As soon as the outside lights are activated by the motion sensors, we see that the front of the shack is completely littered with beer bottles and cans. Now, how do they react? We're gonna fuck this pig. We find who did it. And we beat the shit out of them. So as far as first episodes go for season premieres, this one really didn't disappoint. We got a lot of questions answered on what happened to some of the characters following the events from season 2's finale. Some of the key questions being what is Tennis going to do about the baby? What happened to Angie? What happened to Katie and is she coming back? And my final lingering question, what happened to Rosie? So what's left? We learned about Devin's departure but a new question arises. Who is this new character that visited the skids in a clown costume and ran away after throwing a stink bomb in their basement? Things are about to get good. All right, you fucking pheasants. All right, you fucking pheasants! Coach, players only meeting. I'm so sorry. Episode two opens up with Riley and Jonesy leading the players only meeting. 
I actually like what they had to say here. Pretty much they said that no matter how good it might have felt to score, it ended up not mattering in the end because they still lost. They tell the team that the first thing they need to do is get rid of the Puck Bunny if they want to focus on winning. The Senior Five are completely oblivious to who Riley and Josie are talking about, so they ended up telling them straight up that they are referring to Angie. And speaking of Angie, she causes quite a stir in the locker room when she asks the Senior Five to come join her for Appies. While they fight each other to see who will be going with her, Riley and Josie take this opportunity to confront Angie, though it doesn't go very well. We need to talk. Hey bud, sick dangles last weekend. Mixing a W, but still, unreal roadie for the boys. Listen. You too, bud. Silky, silky miss last weekend. Love that knee down half clapper. Unreal. What you wanna talk about, bud? Nothing. Sicky, what about you, bud? Nothing. Unreal. Well, I'm gonna go crush a sando. Appy's a hundy P boys. No, oh, I hate that. <sighs> Speaking Puck Bunny, bro. Oh, God. So the issue they ran into when trying to talk to her was her speaking Puck Bunny, which is pretty much when a girl talks like a hockey player and uses all of their lingo. To thwart this, they come up with a plan to find another person that can speak Puck Bunny. Does anyone come to mind? All right, let's focus on the shack. Now we can fuck this pig. Wayne, Katie, and the rest of the gang are back at the house trying to figure out who trashed their shack. Once reviewing the pictures that Katie's boy toys took, Dan is able to come to the conclusion that the DJs were responsible for the mess. Pitter patter. We knocked twice, but nobody answered. Frickin' frack? Come in. Hi, Katie Cat. Hey, Katie Cat. Riley and Josie also visit Katie about the Pug Bunny situation. <sighs> not my pig, not my farm. Plus, this girl sounds like she rolls. I should meet her one day. Adios. Well, you have met her already, though. I have? Yeah. yeah. Angie. The Angie? Yes. Yes. In. Well, McCrary, how are you now? What are you doing? What are you doing? It's every time you do this. McMurray, what? Wayne, Darian, and Dan meets up with McMurray, Tyson, and Joint Boy to ask for help with dealing with the DJs that trash their shack. To help lure the DJs, McMurray proposes to advertise a party inviting different races since the DJs, according to McMurray, are all known racists. I'll let McMurray explain the rest. That's right, Big Hoss, exactly. So, here's what we could do. Now, hear me out. Just hear me out. What we could do is we advertise a party for ethnicities out here at the shack, and we could use the ethnicities to lure out the DGENs that we want to beat the shits out of. Fuck's sakes, that's offsides. Well, you let me finish, boss hog. Okay, so what we could do, okay, is once we bring the ethnicities out here, we could beat up the DGENs before they could try to beat up the ethnicities. You're still walking a super fine line there, big chief. You didn't let me finish. See, what we can do now is have the ethnicities help us beat up the DGENs like some kind of fantasy revenge of love of ass whooping. I guess I've seen that in a Quentin Tarantino film one or three times. Abort. Angie pays a visit to the locker room to see the senior five, but only one person is there to greet her, Katie. And she is there with a vengeance. Been wheeling? Turning on the jets, yeah. Some notches on the bedpost. I've been notching. Hashtag notch or die. Eight cleef notch. Who? Been making my way up the roster. Uh, full roster? No call ups, obviously. Yeah, of course. They're not even schmelts yet. And not Riley and Jonesy. I never touched them. I never want to piss you off. <laughs> About that. Yeah. Do you remember when you cheated on my brother? Yeah. And I went around town telling everyone that I was going to get you. Yeah. But then you left town, so I couldn't. Couldn't what? Get you. Yeah. I guess I could still. Get you. 
Yeah. Stay away from this dressing room. Yeah. And all the players in it. Yeah. Especially Riley and Jonesy. Yeah. And one more thing. Yeah. Open your eyes. Fucking get after it then. All right. I'm not going to say exactly what I thought was going to happen, but for a good while, I didn't know where this conversation was leading. I'll leave it at that. But good for Katie, though. As Katie makes her way out of the stadium, we see her call Wayne and man, at this point, I had the biggest smile on my face. Hey, big brother. Good new. Don't say I never done nothing for you. The person we saw just as a clown at the end of the last episode is back. The skids all confront the clown believing that it was Devin in the costume, but once Stuart pulls off the mask, we see that it's... Uh, a girl! <laughs> Wayne comes to the realization that the easiest way to guarantee that the Dajuns stay away from their shack is not by fighting them, but to repel them. Only two people could accomplish such a difficult task. The Ginger and Boots. It had to have been a sick ostrich. I was really surprised to see the character decisions made in this episode. Especially since the whole episode revolves around seeking revenge on three fronts. The first one being Wayne and friends trying to get back at the DJs for messing up their shack. The second one being with Katie getting even with Angie after she cheated on Wayne. And also kind of sort of to help Riley and Jonesy. And the third being Stuart trying to get back at who he thinks is Devin after being pranked by a masked clown none of them knew. The biggest surprise to me was Wayne's decision not to fight, but instead to think of another alternative plan to deal with the DGENs. I think it's actually the first time in the show so far that Wayne willingly turns out a fight for a more favorable solution. It almost happened back in season one when Joint Boy offered to shake Wayne's hand instead of fighting because he helped his cousin Alexander, but we all remember how that went. I completely understand why Wayne chose not to fight. They would have definitely been outnumbered, but I didn't expect their plan B to be a completely non-confrontational one. Good on you, Wayne. I'm impressed. Ugh, I did also want to talk about the clown girl the skids unmasked, but to keep this video linear, I'll just wait until she's properly introduced in the next episode. And with that, let's move on to episode 3. Katie asks to borrow Wayne's truck to return Shepard Kingsley back to the city. Before she leaves, Derry reminds her to be back in time for the opening of Bodine's 2. It's been a while since everyone in Letterkenny had a mutual place to hang out at. To help get out with the reopening, Derry and Dan agree to pick up the kegs from a guy named Jivin Pete. Wayne has no intention of going with them because of what he did to his sister. Jivin honked his horn at Katie when she was crossing the street uptown. Jivin shouldn't have done that. Jivin laughed at her too when she jumped. He scared her. To be fair. To be fair. To be fair. To be fair. Jivin's pals laugh too. Jivin's pals shouldn't have done that. Jivin and his pals think so much of themselves, they probably suck each other off. We'll go pick up the kegs from Jivin's. You want us to tell Jivin you're gonna come talk to him? You know how he feels about talkings. You'll hear it from me. 10-4, good buddy. Over and out. Hey, girl. Hey, boy. Superstar DJ. Hey, here we go! This is one of the bigger moments that I've been waiting for. This gets it down with the clown girl. This whole scene is great, but so I don't get smited by the copyright gods, I'll only play a little bit. Who are you? Gay. So am I. I didn't ask what you were, girl. I didn't tell you what I am, boy. Who are you? I'm gay. So am I. No, you're not. That's exactly what my father said to me. So you're in the business of opening rooms, girl? Stop calling me girl, boy. And what shall I call you? Gay. I'm the only gay in this crew! And I was born this way, sister! I support you, remember? Let me get this straight. He's a homosexual? That's exactly what my mother said to me. <laughs> the exact same way! My name is Gay. That's your name? Wow. And I thought Roland's parents never gave him a chance. I did! 
So I've been waiting for this to happen, but I just didn't know who it would happen to. What I'm talking about is someone finding another love interest after Katie. Before this moment, we had Riley, Jonesy, and Stuart all left devastated after the relationships ended with Katie. I love seeing a good bounce back. But back to the episode, we find out the girl's name is unironically gay, and that she was sent to later Katie due to her bad behavior. Knowing that much about her, Stuart quickly grows an interest in her. Listen up, you pylons. Grab any plugs. With Katie's help of getting rid of Angie, the Letterkenny Irish can now refocus on winning. Riley and Josie's plan is to get the guys chirping in hopes to throw their opponents off their game mentally. The coach interrupts the meeting to introduce a new player to the team. Got any guesses who it could be? Look at this tour de force. This PS the resistance. This master PS. Huh? What the fuck are you looking at, Ted fucker? Give your balls a cup. Fuck you, Shorzy. Fuck you, Riley. Fight me. See what happens. Yeah, what's gonna happen, Shorzy? Three things. I hit you, you hit the pavement, ambulance hit 60. It's the worst chirp I've ever heard in my entire life, Shorzy. That's my slow learning midnight and uncle's favorite chirp. Yeah, it's your mom's favorite chirp too, body asker. See what happens. Yeah, what's gonna happen, Shorzy? Three things. I hit you, you hit the pavement, I fuck your mom again. Fuck you, Shorzy. Fuck you, Jonesy. Your mom just liked my Instagram post from two years ago in Puerto Vallarta. Tell her I'll put my swim trunks on for her anytime she likes. Kill her now. Good, and you? I'm bad. We finally see Modine's too while Gail is having a drink with the Hicks. After a small conversation, she introduces two new waitresses that she hired. There's someone else here? Yeah, hired a couple waitresses. Oh, Bonnie McMurray. Out of the clutch again. Barney McMurray and Glenn. Barney is always looking good, but man, I was so surprised by Glenn's new little makeover that Gail gave him. She even got him LASIK so he wouldn't have to wear his glasses anymore. For a second, I'd even recognize him. Now, before we proceed, does thou knoweth where Devon is? Who? Devon? No. No. Yes. Yes? No. <laughs> Back at the ski residence, Stuart asks Gay if she knows where Devin is, still believing that he sent her to them. It turns out that she didn't even know who Devin was, meaning this was all just one big coincidence. They then ask why she was wearing a clown costume, where she then explains, Don't you watch the news? There are clowns inflicting apprehension on the general public via sheer terrorism or petty vandalism all over North America. So you've coalesced with some sort of continental intercolonial clown posse? I'm a bad seed. Staying out late, missing curfew, you know. Mm, I know. So this was actually a pretty good excuse if you remember back in 2016 when all the clown sightings began in both the US and Canada. Gay's interrogation slowly just turns into a conversation as Stuart gets more and more insight on the type of girl she really is. And with that, Stuart grants her asylum within the skids, but he has one last request before he considers her a true skid. Give me three good reasons why you fear you must rebel. I hate the world. I hate my parents. I hate myself. As you were. My parents banished me here for poor behavior. It is my goal to behave even worse than Letterkenny, so they have no choice but to bring me back. Formidable. Riley and Josie do a quick run through with the hockey players on how chirping should be done. When the Senior Five attempts to give it a try, it's a clear indication to Riley and Josie that this whole mental game is going to be harder than they thought. Stuart announces a new alias for the skiz known as Fack You. Freaks acting crazy united. Pretty much the goal is to wreak havoc dressed as clowns, so mostly just petty vandalism.
All right, boys, two seconds left. Let's show us what you got. Remember what we taught you, boys. Back with the hockey players, we see the senior five attempting to chirp in hopes that it'll turn the game around. We do end up seeing that Riley and Josie's strategy worked, though they still ended up losing because they decided to try it so late in the game. No ostrich fuckers here, Hicks. I hear you're going around town saying I'm full of shit. The Hicks run into Jav and Pete while they're walking to Modine's too. He confronts Wayne telling him that he's heard what he has been saying about him. Here's how Wayne handles it. Would you say it to my face? I'm embarrassed this got to you before you heard it from me. You should be. I think you're full of shit and you and your pals think so much of yourselves so you probably suck each other off. Are you fucking serious? What's anybody gonna do about it? Say you're sorry. I'm sorry. Don't honk at girls. And don't holler at girls. And don't talk to them when they're not interested in talking to you. And don't talk to them unless they're interested in talking to you. Done for? Over and out. The ending of this episode was so satisfying. After not having Modines for so long, it was so refreshing to actually see the whole town smiling and dancing and drinking together. But there's definitely a cherry on top here that had me smiling from ear to ear. Rosie shows up and dances with Wayne. I almost teared up a little bit if I'm being honest. The music, everyone actually happy and nothing going wrong. It was just an overall wholesome scene. Just seeing Wayne being able to let his guard down for a little while and dance with someone he feels comfortable around just made me feel so giddy. And I mean really giddy. I'm pretty sure I ended up doing that little noise. This is the first episode I'm actually going to rate. To me, this is a solid 10 episode. From beginning to end, it was so well executed. The perfect introduction to Gay and the setup for Stuart's new love interest. The message to not say anything behind anyone's back that you aren't willing to say to them directly. The development of Riley and Jonesy and the rest of the hockey team and the return of Shorzy. This rebranding of the skids from druggies to vandals. Wayne standing up for Katie and lastly the revival of Modine's. This episode made me feel so full. There's nothing that I would have added to make this any better. Already, this is one of my favorite seasons. I loves fishing in Quebec. Who doesn't love fishing in Quebec? Great fishing in Quebec. I fucking hate Quebec. This episode, we go on a trip to Quebec. Stopping for a quick piss break, we learn that Derry really dislikes Quebec and the people in it. When they make it to the fishing area, we learn why Derry doesn't like Quebec. It's because to him, the women don't like him back because he's not attractive enough. Love life aside, he says that he can never tell what they're saying and that there aren't any good French guys. Upon arriving to where they want to set up shop, we hear the laughter and radio of locals who are also fishing there. Who's that? The French. What's the red stuff, Schmelz? Shred the red, boys. Shred the red, boys. Less meals, all wheels. Riley and Jonesy introduces their new protein shake to the team, stating that it's their meals on wheels called Shred the Red. However, there's a clear downside to these protein shakes. Shit. With more casual visits to the restroom, lucky for us, this means more chirping scenes featuring Shorzy. Roll lets Stuart know that he still doesn't trust Gay. He quickly dismisses Roll and starts planning Operation Gay. The mission itself is simple, do as many bad things as possible until her parents have no choice but to take her back. In this plan specifically, they are going to be stealing mailboxes. Stuart does bring up an interesting fact though. Best of all, 
Wayne et al. will assume that the destruction is caused by Tannis and her crew again. It's perfect. I've missed our tennis field scenes. <laughs> At the ice fishing hole, the Higgs are having a terrible time trying to get the French guys with their radio to quiet down. The whole thing turns into one-way shouting matches because neither party is speaking the other's language. One thing the French do pick up on, however, is when Derry brings up Celine Dion in a harsh tone and they are no longer having it. The long back and forth is halted by the introduction to a new character, Anique. Ah, uh, French women. She is hot. I'm pretty sure the French word for hot is show. I'd like to show her something. We go back over to the Hicks just in time to see Derry fancying over the new French edition, Anique. Katie tries to get him to talk to her, but he's still too self-conscious to do anything. While the French are getting ready to leave, they throw over one of the frozen fish that they caught and catches the attention of all the Hicks, just in time for Derry to see Anique waving him goodbye. Somehow, Riley and Josie were able to persuade their whole team into trying their shred the red protein shakes, and the whole team ends up shitting their pants during practice. Back in the skids' basement, we see them all having a small celebration on a mission accomplished, but most importantly, we get a quick glance of Rold finally taking a liking to Gay. What do you mean? Oh! Well? Give me three reasons why you feel you must rebel. I hate the world, I hate my parents, I hate myself! As you are. Fuck you! After a failed fishing trip, the Hicks decide to call it a day. But before they can leave, the DJs show up. They end up being outnumbered, but the French return just in time to help them out. So one thing the Hicks and the French have in common, they both hate DJs. After the fight, they all have beers around the campfire, and it turns out they both speak a little bit of each other's language. Do you speak English? Oui. Yes. Toi, tu parles français? Yes. Oui. Je suis désolé, je parle un petit peu français, mais uh, je veux essayer. No problem. Of course. Mais on va parler français. Bon. Bon scrap. Well, it's best to avoid a scrap when you're going fishing. But you hate DJs from up country too, huh? Hmm. Tu penses que vos douchebags sont pires que les nôtres? Tu dois venir chez nous. Yeah? Now, where exactly is up country Quebec? Laval. Derry ends up retracting his earlier statement about the French, and Anique formally introduces herself and tells him directly that she thinks he's good looking. He's surprised to see that she speaks English and tells him that pretty much everyone in Quebec does. And just like that, Derry might have found him a love interest. Sure thing, Bonnie. See you soon. What's the frequency, Kenneth? Bonnie McMurray has invited us to a hot tub party. Bonnie invites the Hicks to a hot tub party where they all happily accept. We see a little bit of competitiveness coming from Daryl and Dan as they determine who will win over Bonnie where Katie then throws herself in the running for her heart. How do you know? It's not us. That's bad. Did you hear me, Shirt Tucker? All the clown costumes, the petty vandalism around Letterkenny, it's not us. Well, if not heard about it, it must be so bad. Tennis gives Wayne a call to let him know that the vandalism happening around Letterkenny isn't them, and that she'll be looking into it to see who it is. Of course, we all know that it's actually the skids. And speaking of the skids, they're back at the basement spending the last 10 hours of their time playing video games. 
Being too busy chatting and determining what to do next, Tannis was able to sneak into the basement without any of them noticing to talk to them about the vandalism happening around town. Players only meeting. Players only meeting further. In the players only meeting, Riley and Jonesy introduced a small fine system to help better the team. One of the violations that we're told about is not manscaping. After letting them know of that, we then see them trying to get through to Boomtown for being too shy with his body around the other guys and they try to encourage him to show his wood stack <laughs> to the team to cure him of that shyness. You ever got into someone's car and your wet swim trunks and had to turn on the seat warmers? No. That makes it feel like a feed. No, big brother, that's almost not worth talking about. Or no. And the part of the episode that I've been personally waiting for is finally here. Bonnie's hot tub party. Where the battle for Bonnie McMurray will take place. We also get a little surprise guest. Rosie. But back to the main event, Katie is the first one to make a move. Who's that? What's that? Tennis. What's a tennis? Well, aren't you a little bundle of sass? We get to witness a really interesting square off between Tennis and Gay, and also how good Gay is at reading people. We learn that she got her gift of knowing how people are feeling from her mother, who is a psychologist. Speaking of Gay's mother, does she look a little familiar? Well, she should. That's Kim. She was Wayne's first blind date back in season 2, episode 3. She was the one that he called too hard. I definitely wasn't expecting to see her again, but it does make sense now why Gay is so intelligent. Anyway, Gay's mother has come to take her back to the city. I guess Operation Gay appeared to have worked too well and maybe faster than any of them would have hoped. Tyson! Joint boy? You guys can play? Riley and Jonesy run into Joint Boy playing some hockey while the player is in the locker room, and they see the two actually knowing what they're doing. This prompts them to ask if they'd like to join the Letterkenny Irish, where they then quickly go to introduce them to the rest of the team. Though, during this specific time, basically everyone had their pants down around their ankles to help Boomtown overcome his fear. But hey, it ended up working. Congratulations, DGens. Your jokes just cost us company. Rosie and Wayne end up leaving the hot tub, and Katie, Derry, and Dan ask Bonnie who, out of the three of them, she would go out with. It turns out she liked them all for their own specific reasons, but she just wasn't looking for any sort of commitment right now. She goes on to say that she's more looking for someone she can fool around with without having any strings attached. <laughs> Wayne? Yeah? Thanks for not turning the seat warmers on in your truck. Kind of makes you feel... Like you peed? Yeah. Yeah. Wayne takes Rosie back home and they both seem to just level each other out so well. I love how they give each other space to be themselves but also miss each other. But above all things, I also love how they know what they want when they want it. Will you be reading tonight? Yeah. I hope you'll enjoy your book. After we make some dad noises. Great. You're having breakfast with your pals the other day. If you haven't noticed, I haven't really been covering the cold openings to this season due to it not directly impacting the story, but this one I'm going to make an exception on because it's so damn funny. I never imagined that I would see Wayne imitating a baby so spot on, but oh my god, this is gold. Yeah. So in the beginning of the cold opening, we see a fed up Katie telling how annoying a drunk Derry, Dan, and Wayne are. There are even nicknames for their drunk selves, Scary Dairy, Madman Dan, and Wayne the Pain. But the big portion of the co-opening centers around Dan's claim that babies are smart, where Wayne then claims that that was the stupidest thing that he's ever heard. But that isn't all. He demonstrates. Okay, Dan. Man, okay. Okay, Dairy. Dairy, okay. Dan, hold your thumb out. Dairy, 
Go wide-eyed, stick your tongue out, and coo like you're doing it to a baby. I'm going to be a baby, okay? Clean it up. <sighs> the Hicks walk into a complete trash mode Deans and Gail tells them that she has some rowdy degens the night before. Daria recommends hiring Ginger and Boots to be her bouncers, but she tells them that she already found someone. Bradley! I fucking love Bradley. To say the least, everyone loves Bradley. While they all go around saying how much they love him, Gail chimes in and says, Nobody loves Bradley more than Rosie. Oh god, foreshadowing. Now after everyone is done saying how much they love Bradley, Gail says that he should be here any second, where they then decide to sit around and wait for him until he arrives. As everyone makes their way to the bar, Katie gets a text from Riley and Jonesy asking if she can come to their game tonight. So this part is actually interesting to me a little bit because the last time they asked Katie to come to their game, she did and they got jealous of all the guys looking and talking about her. Jealous enough for them to tell her not to come to their games anymore. So you can take this two ways. One, they're over Katie and want her to see how good the team is doing. Or two, they want Katie back. Or both for that matter. Riley and Jonesy give Joy Boy and Tyson their jerseys. They're given what's known as the toughest numbers in hockey. Number 28 to Joint Boy and number 9 to Tyson. <laughs> Roldy. <laughs> Rolled. This is what we've been working towards, remember? It's a sad time with the skips as they say their final goodbyes to Gay before she heads back to the city. The whole scene actually made me feel pretty sad. She honestly was the perfect addition to the skids. I would never have guessed that the writers would get rid of her so soon. The biggest hit to me was that Gay was Stuart's first real love interest since Katie, and there was a genuine connection between the two of them. The feelings were actually mutual too, and they both liked one another. It worries me a little bit because now that Stuart knows what being liked back feels like, how is he going to react once that feeling is taken away from him? Yes, you are. The ending of this scene broke my heart. After trying to hold it in for so long and trying to act strong in front of Gay, Stuart also breaks down crying alongside the rest of the skids. He's so close I can smell him. I'm about to slide right off this chair, boys. That libido works harder than soldier stack of sandbags for a flood. That's a Texas-sized hand for a gamer. Back at Modine's, we see the skids are still sitting there waiting for Bradley to show up. When he finally arrives, I expected a little bit more from him. The reason why I say that is because he's meant to be the bouncer, but he came off as more of a jokester and the non-confrontational type. Bradley appears to be an all-around people person. I couldn't see a guy with that kind of personality keeping a bar in order. <laughs> oh my god. I don't really have anything important to say about this part, but I'm going to show it anyway because it's hilarious. It's the first time Katie has seen Glenn since she's been back. And man, did she miss something. Who's that? Go over and see for yourself. And where did you come from, Glenn? Oh, hi, Katie. Is Wayne here with you? Ooh, there he is. Hi, Wayne! I love this. We're twins! <sighs> Busy winter's over. We 
see that kitty actually ended up going to Riley and Josie's hockey game, and the guys look happy until... That fucking masterpiece, boys. I'd master that piece, boys. Look at those legs go up and make a complete fucking ass out of themselves. I'd wear that out, boys. Joint boy, beat the shit out of that guy. Give your balls a tug, you tip. That experiment worked wonderfully, buddy. Where's their weight in gold, buddy? Once it's Riley and Josie's turn to hit the ice, they both seem pretty composed. Until the opponents start talking about Katie. To say the least, they did not take that lightly. Yep. 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 Dance machine in the ring. Juicy lips. Watching glow in the sauce. She asked him, who was that? I ain't show up, I just showed up. Greet my people, spill they cup. Transmit heat on pillows, plush. I mean, I mean it though. I'm lean and flow, I gleam and glow. I'm clean and oh, oh. Bet you that I get it, bro. Inside the glow, just not for show. Three beans, purples, indigo. Catchy as yes, but trendy, no. Never been a scheming, no. That's beneath Barbara Jean on spring with Poe. I never seem to know. Dumb beans come from Arsenal. Up or don't toss it at all. Up or don't toss it at all. Up or don't toss it at all. On Bowser Duty tonight, Bradley is able to scare off a group of DJs without even having to say anything to them. So I stand corrected, he is an effective bouncer. While tonight was going good, Bradley is now confronted with a bigger, more annoying issue. The Hicks being super drunk. They collectively wear down his patience. First you have Wayne the Pain continuously asking for him to do impressions. Next there's Madman Dan continuously asking for a race. And lastly, Scary Derry doing his weird thing where he rubs his nipples on people. Anyone else feeling wayward? <laughs> Meanwhile in Stuart's basement, we see them all sitting there depressed about gay leaving. Stuart calls for one final fact you mission in Gay's honor. But once their mission is put to a halt by the cold weather and snow, they go back to their old ways. Drugs. The hockey game ended up being called due to the fight that broke out. That in itself, even though neither team scored a point, they considered a win for them. But as things are going well, a small bump of the road approaches. Katie tells Riley and Jonesy that she wants to get back together, but with only one of them, which causes quite a predicament. You know, God bless you, man, but you gotta stop it with that nipple shit. Back at Modine's, we see the Hicks getting on Bradley's last nerve. Having no more patience left, Bradley headbutts both Derry and Dan, knocking them out cold. Wayne quickly snaps out of his drunken state and begins to roll up his sleeves. I'll let you see what happens from here. Bradley? Wayne? That's Bradley's favorite cousin. Trouble in paradise? Shirt pucker? Wayne, please, no. No one loves Bradley more than Rosie. Old school, new school, need to know this. Get your game up, you better keep focus. When I tell you I held my breath upon Rosie's arrival to when Wayne unbuttoned his other cuff, I really mean I held that shit. Up until now, Wayne and Rosie have had zero problems. They gave and respected each other's space, listened to one another, and enjoyed each other's company. But a line was crossed. Bradley hurt Wayne's friends. He didn't just hurt them, he knocked them out. The whole situation sucks because if they didn't follow Bradley's advice to get really, 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 really drunk, none of this would have happened. But then again, you can't just blame Bradley here. Katie also told Wayne, Derry, and Dan to clean up their act and not to drink that much again at the beginning of the episode. As we can see, none of them listened. What does season 4 have in store for us now? <laughs> oh my god. Before I end this video, I want to give a quick thanks for the 700 plus subscribers as I'm recording this. I know these videos are long and also take a while to come out, but I'm relieved to know that so many people have decided to stick around to see what becomes of this barren channel. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.